All right, folks, we're back with another episode of Skirmish Supremacy. Tonight we are joined by Gary Zanker of Writer's Blocks, which is a uh, really cool and unique twist on game design. And, of course, as usual, uh, we have Nick over there doing the co-hosting thing. Which tonight he's doing it mobile because uh, apparently his computer's all jacked up or something. I don't know what's going on. Nobody ever knows. But uh, anyway, Gary, how are you doing tonight, man? Excellent. How are you guys doing? I'm doing fantastic. Nick, how are you doing over there? I'm doing all right. Uh, it's actually all tore apart from the live stream on uh, Saturday, and I just forgot to set it back up. Oh, well, see, that'll do it. Awesome. So, Gary, it was good having you, having you come on tonight. I know that uh, when you initially contacted us on our Facebook page, you were kind of, I guess, leery, if you will. You're like, I don't know if this is the kind of game that you guys normally cover, but here it is. And, and that's true because, in truth, I'm not a gamer. Per se, it, I just went to Dexcon and discovered the most amazing experience, right? But it was totally different than anything I've ever experienced before. So that's why when I contacted you, I just didn't know because I'm not so familiar with the gaming industry that I know all of the popular podcasts like you are. Well, popular is a, a far stretch, but uh, yes, thank you for thank you for noticing us, though. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you said that you are not a gamer, so. Um, so what exactly do you do for like, I guess the, the day job? Cause you, you have an interesting looking game here. Okay. So thank you. Um, I'm a marketing guy. So I do, you know, everything from strategic 30,000 foot level and helping companies determine what their direction should be. And then a lot of times I also get into the nitty gritty and I do the, the, uh, tactical implementation of those plans. Sometimes, sometimes I do only one or the other, depending on where they need help. Um, so, so I'm a marketing guy at heart, and I do a lot of writing. In fact, the genesis of this game, and by the way, stop me if I start to talk too much. Okay? <laughs> I want um, you to consider this the Gary Zinker show. You go off on whatever rambles you want to. Wow, that's really nice. Um, thank you. Um, so, so I run two writers groups. I have for about nine years, I've run two writers groups. And my goal has always been to create this community where I can help people achieve their goals in publishing, become a better writer. And, and that last thing that often avoid that writers have a problem with is making friends, making associates, because writing is a solo act in a lot of cases. Right. So as I was doing this, some of the programming we did was interactive writing in our writers group. Now, I know that sounds like the most boring thing in the world, but for a lot of people, it's just storytelling. It's not, don't consider it writing, consider it storytelling. And we would start throwing out prompts on the spot and making people write a story in 10 or 15 minutes out of prompts we would give them. And prompts being words in different categories. Um, you know, something, a character, an object, an event, a timing, something that they weren't prepared for. And we had a lot of fun. And the really cool thing about it is when you walk, go around the room and you listen to the stories people how differently they approach the very same words because hmm. that's that's storytelling so think of it think of it as an age-old tradition and we just kind of updated it a little bit it was so much fun that i ended up thinking how could i bring this to a lot of other people and they're the ones who identified it kind of as a party game when i brought the first rendition of it to them i said this is a writer's tool and they said no it's a party game gary and I said, no, it's a writer's tool. You don't understand. I tried to force them to understand my way. And what they really did was show me that I was wrong. It's a party game. If you make the round six minutes and you make people have to write really fast and think really fast, it's incredible fun. Desperation makes things funny, right? Yeah. So you're desperate to get all these words, these concepts into the uh, story that you're creating in six minutes. And, and just for reference... In six minutes, you can write about two and a half paragraphs if you're fast. Maybe three if you're really fast. So you have to think on the fly. You're taking these six words that don't go together at all and trying to make a story out of them. And then when I was testing the game, you know, some people said, mm, make it harder. And I'm going, really? You're not finishing a story to begin with. You really want it harder? They said, we'll follow any rules you give us. That must be a gamer thing, right? It is, yeah. Okay. So I, so I said, okay, well, maybe we need a plot twist in here 
they called it an F me kind of thing. And I said, well, let's make it nicer. <laughs> let's call it plot fest. And in the middle of the game, I throw them something that throws their story completely off. So do you want me to give you an example? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Okay. So, so at Dexcon, I was lucky enough to have tables of people come and um, play the game, right? And so what it is is it's six dice that you roll, and those dice come up with numbers, and that goes to a grid, and the grid gives you these different words in different categories. So just as an example, the categories are timing, genre, object, setting, character, and event. So um, we rolled the dice, and I'm, I'm looking for one of the stories I can read you that actually I have written out all of the prompts, because sometimes when we're moving fast, they write the prompts on a different sheet of paper instead of on the um, story thing. Okay, so here's here's one. This uh, let me. And I'm sorry. I'm a little slow at this. I didn't think about doing this until the last second. I'm not going to be able to read you all the prompts. Um, the um, genre was science fiction. The location was hospital. The timing was 50 years in the future. The event was class reunion. Um, high heels was the object. And there was one more prompt that I kind of forgot. So this is the story that was created. The second moon was in eclipse, ensuring that tonight would attract the weirdos, like we needed at the 10th, 2067 class reunion. They were already freaks, in my opinion. Not that the damn pesticide, which they banned 20 years ago, didn't help. It turned some of the more susceptible people into mindless drones paying at the moons. Moons, plural. Given that the school had been closed for five years, we met at the psychiatric hospital in the waiting room. The residents kept passing by. One begged to be freed from the wheelchair she claimed she was psychically trapped in. Then in walks Tamara, her high heels clicking on the ceramic floor. Tap, 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 like the way she used to make my heart go before she skipped out of the prom with my best friend. And that's all you can finish in six minutes. Wow. Okay. That's, but but using all of those prompts, you know, that's that's kind of what you end up creating out of that. And different people, of course, created radically different stories. Hmm. Okay. So there's a, so the fun part is if, if you like telling stories, because of course it doesn't work if you're not a storyteller. The fun part is challenging yourself to work all of those in to get a point for every prompt. You get a point for everyone around the table who thinks your story is the best. Okay. So if, you get you, you have a point for every prompt, and then if they all vote that your story is the best, then it's seven points total. Well, actually, you get a point from everyone who votes your story the best. The oh, okay. Around the table, each of them get a vote on the best story. Okay, cool. That makes a little bit more sense. I was going to say, because otherwise, uh, the, well, the, ga- the gameplay itself would be really neck and neck a lot of the times. Right. And, and the truth is that you don't have to play with the voting. Some people, when I did a lot of testing of this game, some people didn't like the idea of voting for something that was creative. They'll, they're happy to stomp someone in Monopoly or some other game where it's about skill of beating someone. But as soon as it turned out to be something creative, they didn't want to vote. Hmm. So I kind of made that an optional thing. I, I say wimp under my breath. But, <laughs> but um, you know, so... It's a fairly simple game, and it has a number of different applications. So it's good for a party game, especially when people are drinking. Um, I don't drink. <laughs> but I don't drink myself, but it's especially good when people are drinking because they're starting to get crazy. Um, it also gets progressively harder because the first round, you use six prompts. The second round, you choose an extra character and an extra object to work in with the same time period. And the third time you use all eight plus you have a plot twist, which stops you in the middle and you have to do whatever the card says. So the card may say kill a character. It may say incorporate the person to your right into your story with a physical attribute of them. It may have you add another prompt. It could have you add six prompts. So it's definitely designed to make people think fast. 
as far as storytelling and improvise. Wow. Okay. I like so, it. It's, I'm <laughs> as far as the, uh, the gameplay, now obviously you said that this is a writer's tool. People are like, no, it's a party game. Right. For, uh, how easy is this game for people to pick up that may not be writers or um, are just, you know, they've never really been good at it or, you know, even the people that just want to dabble a little bit or see what the challenges of writing. How easy is this game to pick up and actually play? Well, the, the rules are incredibly easy, right? Because it's basically work all the prompts into a story and right. do it in six minutes. Go. So the, that part isn't very tough. Um, the challenge, I think, is the first time people play it, they're just getting their feet wet. And it can be very challenging that first round to try and figure out how, how to focus on something to start creating a story. The second time is much easier. What I find, and that's why I had to make it a little more difficult the second and third round. Because then people kind of got the rhythm the first time. They go, okay, I get it now. So I would say it's fairly easy as long as you want to tell a story. If you're right. that kind of person that likes telling stories. If you're not, it's like any game. That's just the wrong game for you. And that's no harm, no foul. But it's really, it's a really, really easy game because all you need are your brains at that table. You don't need anything else. And, and just because someone writes a little faster or may write, in their everyday job, it doesn't make them any better. Right. That's the surprising thing. It doesn't make them any better. You could be just as good as the person next to you who has written a novel. Hmm. Okay, cool. So, so it sounds like it could be, it could take you like a round or two to kind of pick it up. But then once you get it, you get it. Um, right. And like, like you said, not everybody is going to like the game. It's, you know, there's, there's certain games people like certain games people don't. Right. That's perfect. But uh, as, as far as this goes, like how long did it take for you to develop this as a concept? And then, you know, obviously I know you kind of started as like a fun way for a writing tool. And then people said, no, this is a game. How long did it take you from the moment that you heard that to kind of get to the final product that you have now? So, so I'll tell you the history of this because it's interesting. A friend of mine actually gave me this idea. She used to use grids to figure out how to write short stories. And she said it would be randomized. And she did it with six-sided dice. And and it was very limited. What she did was very limited. She only had three prompts. And I thought, boy, that's not enough variety for me. But it, and it stuck in the back of my head for about three years until it came out after we started doing this in the writer's group. Then I came back to it and said, well, that'd be really cool. So all of a sudden, I'm, I'm going to game stores, right? And I'm picking up dice. And I'm picking up all these beautiful dice. Right. <laughs> Six sided ones, four sided ones, twelve sided ones, and and I'm going and I'm trying to figure out how many prompts makes it interesting. How you know, no one wants to get the same prompts over and over again. You're bored, you're done. So I settled on twenty sided dice because they were fairly easily available and they weren't super expensive. And then I started figuring out the categories. So this took it probably took honestly about six months to run through everything. And and I kept changing the game. The best thing I can tell anyone developing, developing a game is go to your audience and let them break it. Yes. Yes. Right. Because they're the ones, they were geniuses about what they liked and what they didn't like. And I could have sworn this would have been something different. You, you would not have recognized the total game if I had launched it the way I thought it was going to be. And I had to put aside my ego and say, okay, you know what, if this is the way they want to play it, let's let them play it that way and see what happens. And let me watch what happens. So it probably took six or seven months of going back and forth. The other thing was I was doing all the design work. So I did everything in the packaging, everything in the instructions, because that's my skill set. So if I handed that off to someone else, I would have had more time to do other things. But then I, you know, it, it just, it would have had a different feel to it. And so I was doing all of that. The package design, everything was done by me. Okay. So, so that took a little, that took some time. Sure. So being a, a, a solo project like that, like how long did it take you to 
develop the packaging, get, get the logo the way you wanted it, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Cause we've talked to a lot of indie uh, people in the past that, you know, they, they do exactly that where they're like, right. I do hundred percent all of it, but I don't think people really have an idea of how long that really takes and how, how big of a task that really is. It's like, okay, the game's developed cool, but now how do you make it marketable? Like how do you make it yeah. a sellable product? And that's always, that can always be a tough part because, you know, it's kind of, I, I tell a lot of people, it, it, the, the, the fun part's done. You've made the game. Now it's time to kind of look at it right. from the business side. Well, I'll say that preparing all the materials, everything was in that six or seven month period. Because as, as I'm testing the game and doing everything, I'm, I'm changing it and changing it, changing it, you know, over and over again. Right. As a marketer, I would never spend that much time on a project for a client. But this, this is agony because it's mine. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, different. it's different it's it has to be perfect whereas you know where to stop the client because they stop paying it and so <laughs> good distinction I, yeah so so it probably, it probably in that six or seven months it took to do the do the design for the box find the box manufacturer find the people that sold the dice the cheapest you know sourcing everything i could and and calculating the costs for the game and trying to learn about Kickstarter and everything else. And the one thing I did that I don't recommend to anyone is I launched it too early. I was not really prepared for the social media aspect. And there was a private reason why that I won't go into, but I was forced to launch it earlier than I ever wanted it. But I did it and I accepted that that's what I had to do. Um, but there's so much more... I've been learning and I could still learn about matching to the social media. And as I said, I'm not a gamer. So I'm kind of the odd man out learning this. Even, even gamers have a better idea than I do about how to launch this to their audience. Yeah. That could always be a tough thing. If you're kind of, if you're launching a product that you're not familiar with, or like in a, I should say in a, in a, in a, in a field or a category you're not familiar with. Right. So, so writers, I'm much more familiar with how to introduce this to a writer. Um, For gamers, you know, I had some friends who came along and said, Gary, do you know Dexcon is occurring in two weeks? I'm going, really? What's that? (laughs) I don't know that. I'm going, what's that? And they are the most amazing people. They got me in two weeks notice. They got me in and got me four demos to to do a Dexcon. I I cannot thank them enough for being so welcoming to someone who is totally new. Um, just amazing. And then being there was just an amazing experience of, of openness and people who wanted to share their knowledge. Not looking to take advantage of anyone. They were all looking to share their knowledge and help each other. Yeah, so with Dexcon, I'm not familiar with this one. Is that is that much more of like a, um, I guess if you want to call it a game designer's convention, or is it... Uh... More of just like people, it's an official convention for people to play games at. It's some of both. It's definitely a gamers convention. So it's in, it was in Morristown, New Jersey for four days, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, I guess it was a week and a half ago. And they take over the whole hotel. So there's some live role play going on there. There's huge amounts of gaming. I've never seen that many game tables in any given place because they've taken over the whole hotel. And um, it's different. I don't know if you've ever been to Comic-Con or something like that. I've been to Comic-Con. It's way different. This is not about the vendor tables, really. They're there, but that's extra. It's about playing games. Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely – it's a – it's a different feel when you go to a convention that people are playing games at compared to more of like your – I guess if you want to call it kind of stand in line and watch, watch it kind of shows like, right. um, you know, like E3 or Comic-Con where there's tables, there's chairs, there's things like that. But like, it, it's not the, the seating, I guess is not as grandiose if you want to call it that because people don't have like three foot by three foot or four foot by four foot table space that they need for games. They just need like a corner to read their comics and eat yeah. lunch and then they go about their day. Yeah. So tables upon tables upon tables, they're playing everything you can imagine. They're introducing games. They're playing games. They've been out for 20 years. Um, 
And it's fascinating to watch the play, right? Because I play games. I say I'm not a gamer. It's not that I don't enjoy games. I'm just not that level of role-playing game or anything like that. I'm the casual player. Right. You know, I sit down and, and I played some games and it was fun, but I I was, didn't have the intensity everyone else has, of course, unless it was my game. And I really had the intensity. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's certainly understandable. But um, you, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was going to say, you, you're allowed to have your own bias on that. So. <laughs> right. So, so I, I was learning a lot there. And, and as I said, again, um, anyone who, who would come to me and say what I learn out of this, it, it was definitely that there's, there are tons and tons of resources out there. People will help you and they'll lead you. If they're, if they're not even the right person, they'll lead you to the right people. But there are things I still haven't approached. I, um, there are tons of online resources I haven't even tried yet. And as I said, I was kind of forced to launch this fast because I, I needed to before right. it got away from me. I, I had shown it out enough that I didn't want someone else launching it underneath. So um, I, I did that. But n- now comes the second phase, right? Kickstarter ends on July 30th. The second phase is what do I do after that? Because I raised some money. I didn't raise enough to make it a huge success. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'll have raised a couple thousand dollars, maybe maybe three or four by the time it's done. And that's not really enough to do extended marketing. So I have to figure out what's next. But it's a nice base. Yeah, you know, if if you set your goals low on Kickstarter and you're more along the lines looking to fund it for very specific things, you know, it, it, it does well for you. Um, Kickstarter in and of itself is its own marketing tool in, in a lot of ways. You know, I, I know a lot of game companies and, you know, gamers themselves, they look at Kickstarter for like the new stuff. So it's almost like free marketing by launching a Kickstarter because then people start to know, oh, hey, this is a new game that's coming out. They look at it in that way. So, yeah. um, you it's, know, especially for a small publisher like yourself, Kickstarter is fantastic for that. It, it, the challenge of Kickstarter is if you, do, you need your built in audience because Kickstarter will only deliver 30 or 30 percent or so of the audience by itself. 70 percent or more is coming from the work you do to get them to Kickstarter. Yes. Right? So, that's that's the challenge. If you've already got 10 games out there, or you've already got a recognized community presence, it's a lot easier to get people to pay attention to your game. Um, so so all of this has just been a really, a really interesting experience. And I agree with you that Kickstarter is its own marketing force. Um, but you're responsible as the game creator. You're the one responsible for getting the people there, for getting them to, to value the game. And I did, I think I did more stuff than most people do. I was, I recorded everyone at Dexcon reading their story and posted it on the updates, right? I've got a Facebook page. I've got a YouTube channel. I don't know if you've seen the videos. The videos, I got great videos done, not expensively. But I think I went further than most organizations go just because that was the nature of what I do, marketing. Right, right. So the other thing is, look at look at what everyone else does and what it takes to cut through the clutter. Yeah, I could, I could definitely agree with, with you on that one. That can that can definitely be a challenge is cutting through that clutter, especially nowadays with so many companies that are launching Kickstarters. Um, you know, you always worry about like, well, if I launch it now, is is my Kickstarter going or my project going to get lost amongst like something that a giant company is doing? Mm-hmm. You know, where it's just like I, I become, you know, something that's just, you know, caught in the drift and nothing really happens with it where they're making the big splashes. And uh, honestly, nowadays, it's it's almost it's almost impossible to dodge like the large companies because they're always launching something. So sure, and why it, wouldn't you? Well, if you're yeah. a large company and you don't have to insert the cash, but you can get other people to put out the cash for you. Why wouldn't you do that? Exactly. Yeah. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's been, you know, kind of a contentious thing amongst, uh, game designers themselves and, you know, the, the, the brick and mortar like hobby retailers, 
Right. You know, it's a brick and mortar hobby retailers look at it as like, well, you just cut us out of the sale. So we don't care about your products anymore kind of thing. But at the same time, you know, if you're making the money doing it that way and you know, you're a single person, you don't want to assume all the risk for it. Why wouldn't you take right. the chance? You know, that's so interesting. By the way, I want to, I want to mention something about a game store that I didn't mention. I should have the games keep in Westchester, Pennsylvania was the first place I went to when I kind of had things modeled out. And the guy, the owner there is Carl, and he spent like two hours with me talking about it. He had nothing to gain. He knew I was going to Kickstarter. He had nothing to gain. He spent two hours with me talking about how he operates his store and what he sees as successful and not successful and gave me things that changed the way I thought about it and what I would do. So, you know, I would never want to cut those people out because they're so they're so giving to their community. Right. Yeah. And that, so, in particular. yeah, that, so that, that's, no, no, that's totally fine. That's actually where a lot of the people um, that are, I guess you want to call them habitual, uh, <laughs> habitual Kickstarter project makers. Right. Like they, they start to kind of lose the fact that like there, there has to be life for it after the Kickstarter. And that is where your local game store comes in. And I, honestly, a lot of local game stores, like you being a single guy doing this all your, you know, doing it all yourself, like the, the company is a company of one, right? They're, they're totally cool with you doing it where a lot of them have the issue is when it's like, suddenly you're a four or $5 million company launching a new Kickstarter every month and basically cracking, you know, two, $3 million every right. single time you do a Kickstarter. Then they start looking at you going, mm, maybe I don't want to support you anymore. And, and I totally understand that because in the end, you know, it's funny. I think about comic books and comic book stores have a really tough time because you can go buy everything at a different place for 40% off, right? But yeah. the, difference, yeah. the difference is that you read alone. Typically, you read your comics alone. You may want to discuss them later, but you read them alone. But gaming is almost always with other people. And those stores, at least what they – because they have the gaming there and they dedicate the space to it, they're smart enough to know that that's how they have to hold on to their clientele. That if they're, they may not be able to compete with price, but they can compete by creating that community within the community. Yes, very much so. And I, I, want, to, I want to give another shout out to him because this past Friday, he let me do a demo game at his place too. And, you know, I brought pizza. I brought sodas because – the least I could do if he's doing that is feed the gamers that come there. Yeah, so. absolutely. <laughs> gamers are like plants. If you keep them fed and watered, they'll keep coming back. That's, that's <laughs> what they told me. That's what they told me. So I thought that was a fa- I thought that was a fair exchange. It's just a small bribe. Food's a small bribe. Um, yeah, well, pizza's like the magic bullet there. So I, <laughs> you, you nailed that one pretty easily. Mm, pizza. <laughs> So, so this, what is your favorite game? What's, what's your favorite kind of game and what you really, really love more than anything in the world? A good one. Are we talking board games, miniatures, or role-playing games? Or I think, kind of I think, somewhere in there? I guess what you tell me will tell me more about you. Whichever you want to tell me about. Uh, sure. So, Nick, do you want to start this one or do you want me to? I, I can jump in. Um, right now, one of one of my favorite games at the moment is uh, Blood and Plunder from Firelog Games. Yes, very much so. Okay, and tell me, tell me the the nickel tour of it. So it's a um, 17th central or 17th century historical miniatures game uh, set in the Spanish Main, so the Caribbean, and it features privateers. Um, Currently, there's three factions, Spanish, French, and English. Each one has its own unique abilities. And, you know, there's things that, you know, go back and forth that has ships. Um, so, you know, ships that you can actually sail and fight. It has it where you can fight from land to sea or sea to land or completely sea or just completely land. You know, and it has all the different units and in, uh, in guys. So that sounds awesome. Miniatures are just fun, right? They're just, they're works of art in themselves usually. Yes, very much so. 
Yes, most definitely. You know, so that's... Is, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, for, for me, like, the idea of miniatures, because I've always been growing up creative and artistic as far as, uh, you know, the things that I've always really liked. Like, I grew up, I really liked comic books. I, you know, I, I liked creating things and crafting. So for me, the fact that I have a game that outside of the game, I can take these, you know, resin or metal or plastic mm-hmm. toy soldiers, really, and modify them and assemble them and paint them to look exactly how I want them to, to be like, that is my model. And it still is a game piece that has rules and everything else is what always really intrigued me to miniature gaming. You know, and I always tell people too, even if you're not like some professional painter or professional sculptor, the fact that you even take the time to do it makes that miniature yours. And you know, people, even, even if like all you can, managed to do because you just started painting is put a couple basic colors on there and yeah, it might look a little messy, but you know what? At the end of the day, you're proud of it when it's done and nobody's right. going to take that away from you. Right. It is, it is an amazing time too, because look at all the digital printing that goes on and how far that's advanced and what that's going to be able to do where previously, you know, it cost a fortune to be able to, to make miniatures and figures someone could on their own actually create their own game, their own prototype pretty easily these days, which could yeah. have happened even 10 years ago. Oh, there's no way. No, unless you had your own, like, I mean, the cheapest way to do it and probably most economical is to have your own uh, metal spin casting studio. And that's, even that is, it's a massive setup in and of itself. <clears throat> so yeah, it, it's definitely game changing the way that 3d printing and everything else is coming along now. So we are seeing a shift of it in the uh, in the in the miniature gaming world, and companies are adapting. Um, but we are still seeing that a lot of people still want like the really nice, high definition, crisp, clean sculpts that you can only get by hand sculpting. Right. So, you know, there, there's still you know, regardless of what people think as far as like 3D printing is the way of the future, there's still there's still a very strong want and desire for people that hand sculpt. So, well, um, you so, see that. And so right now, one of the big things that you see in, in that kind of arena is that there, you know, when something's 3d printed and it's not even the 3d printing process itself, as much as it's the, the 3d sculpting, there's something, even though it can look highly organic, still inorganic about it. It's, it's a little, too smooth compared to just some of the little details and textures you usually end up getting when you hand sculpt. Right. And, and, you know, it, it can, it can still look amazing. There are some amazing looking 3d sculpts out there, but your run of the mill always seems to be missing that little something. Well, maybe maybe it's where some people start as opposed to where they end up with the finished production. They just start it to figure out their prototypes or whatever. The whole thing, you know, I'm, I'm walking around Dexcon again, and what's amazing to me are the parts of the game. I'm seeing, and forgive me, I can't name these games, but I th- see things with steamships, and I see things with trains. I see games with trains and train cars, and, and it's just cool looking, right? I just want to touch all of them. Oh yeah, it's one hundred percent eye porn. That's all it is. Like, yes. And, oh, very much and then, so. And then the pieces, you know, there's a. I see a lot of the same wooden pieces, but I really was attracted to things when things were shiny, when they really looked like gold or really looked like jewels, instead of being, which I'm not, I'm not condemning the little square um, pieces of wood, but it was Maple. fascinating then, right? And I kind of go, ooh. I would definitely pay an extra 80 bucks to have better pieces. Oh yeah. Most people would. Oh, I, definitely. We're, we're definitely reaching the point to where like the idea of just throwing wooden cubes and meeples in a box is sufficient. Like we, we are starting to move beyond that. People want to see a little bit more oomph from their games. When I back to writer's box, when I was doing it, you know, one of the things I really, I was just discovering different dice and the speckled dice People kept telling me, no one cares. I'm going, no, these look a lot nicer. And then I saw metal dice. And I went, 
and I picked them up and I went, holy crap. You know, if you think the pen is mightier than the sword, these dice could kill someone if you use them in my game. <laughs> yeah. And and so so one of the things I did with the levels of Kickstarter was I made one level where you get these really, really expensive metal dice. And most people don't, you know, it's a new game. They don't know. They're, they're not going to go after that. But I said, if I had this game, and that was the last interesting part of the game, was how to design the upscale piece. And it was very obvious because it's a writing game. I put it in a, a wood box that looks like a book and used metal dice and then got the case that would hold the cards and the dice and just kind of decked it out because that's the way I'd want it on a shelf and I'd want to pull it out. I want, you know, it, it does make it a better play. It shouldn't, but it does. <laughs> it just makes it a whole different feel to a game. You could throw the whole thing in a brown paper bag and the mechanically it could still be the same, but people want the nice box, the nice cards, the nice dice. They, they, they want, they want it to be a centerpiece as well. Like when they pull it out, they want their game to be a centerpiece. Yeah. You know, we're, so that's, it's important. I have a really upscale version of Monopoly. I have a really upscale version of Scrabble and, and I have them for that reason. I don't play them very often, but when I do I feel really good about playing them. Oh, Oh, I wanted to mention one more thing. The genius of everyone in doing the testing, right, was people came to me and said, you know, this should also be a card game, Barry. It'd be easier to do as a card game. I'm going, really? I thought the dice made it tangible. I thought it turned writing into or storytelling into something that had some tangibility. They go, cards, cards are fast, cards are easy. So actually last night I'm, I was in the process of converting this to a card game as well to see what kind of happens, what kind of response I get if I show them side by side, which one would people rather play? So, uh, yeah. The, so the, the cards are interesting. And I guess, you know, I, w- we've talked a little bit about it. Um, so you sent me um, a copy of the game. Right. And I haven't really had a whole lot of time. I opened it up. I saw it. I... Um, you know, opened up the packaging, and then I opened up the box itself, saw that uh, I believe there was six different colored dice in there, and there was there's a few other things. You know, I kind of flipped through it really quick, and it was right. probably a week ago now. Uh, and I went, ooh, this looks really cool. You know, I need to look at it. Uh, and then I sat it down because I was trying to get my house ready for uh, family coming into town, and uh, Tim and I had an all-day live stream as we, you know, just – it's really busy, and you know it's unfortunate. I actually was just thinking, uh, you know, where did I set that box? Um, but the dice themselves are are relatively just you know plain dice, other than they're different colors. Right. And if I recall correctly, you roll those dice, and each one of those dice actually correlates to somewhere in the book that comes with it. Right. So the color, what I felt was important was because there's six different prompts, six different categories, the easiest thing to do is make each category a color and then make each die a different color to match that category. But you're not going, well, which one does this refer to? Right? Because six white dice, that's just confusing. And, right. and no. color is fun. <laughs> no, color, color is, is fun. Easier. <laughs> So, and color does make it easier, especially, I mean, you were talking about, um, you know, it's, it's been great fun while people are drinking, you know, to, to play it. Yeah, I, I would imagine um, so. <laughs> or that you at least imagine so. And that is one of the things that I, you know, I thought of, you know, party game or, you know, group get together. And typically some of those we'll, we'll do with uh, Tim and some of his wife's coworkers and some of our friends and all that. And we play a lot of different party games. And, you know, that was my first thought when I saw it is, well, if I'm drinking, I don't have to try and figure out where this diet goes because right. it's a color it matches up. So just two things I wanted to mention. One is that, so the cards follow the same color scheme, right? That was, I absolutely knew don't screw with that because there may, who knows, maybe there'll be some way to mix the two of them together. So the cards Basically, there's six sets of cards. They're all different colors. They all have a prompt on them. You shuffle them up and you pick one. A clue where you pick one one from the character, you know, one from the weapon and one from the character and one from the room. You're doing the same thing, but with six prompts in order to write your story. So that that's the card thing. And there was something else I was going to say, but 
Uh, uh, I wish I could claim I was drinking, but I'm not. <laughs> ah, don't worry. Um, I think the, the card version of it would make it a little bit more, I guess you want to call it like a backpack style game. Right. You know, where it's easier to transport to the store, where it's like you're still getting, it's still spiritually, it's still writer's blocks. It's just mechanics are slightly different to make it, you know, something to where you can slip it into a backpack a little bit easier and take it with you. So there's a there's a little bit more to the game. I should have mentioned this up front, but I I, I am also interested in what you guys are interested in, right? So I wanted to talk yeah. a little and learn that. So there's two things that make this a little bit different. One is that on the back end, the goal is to create a website where people can share their stories. Community is really, really important to me in everything, right? If you can take yeah, absolutely. it and you can move it beyond the confines of when you actually play it. There's something really cool about that. So the part of the goal here is to finish the website so that people can post their stories and share them with the world. So that you can see what prompts they used and what story they created and that you can also share your story because sometimes people are very proud of what they create. Yeah, the other absolutely. Thing is, yeah, and, and so that's just, you know, my writer's group, everything's about that. The other part is that I realized early on you know, I look at a lot of games and look at the expansion packs. And a lot of people have very specific interests in writing so or storytelling. And so what I did was I created nine di- supplementary grids. And I call them prompt grids because I could actually trademark that. <laughs> so, you know, that's always a good thing. So um, I created nine prompt grids that each have to do with a di- different genres. So two of them are for kids. One is for young kids and one is for young adults. One, you know, there's romance, there's science fiction, there's murder mystery, there's horror, there's neurotica, there are a couple more. And so instead of having any genre that you could be writing at with this game, you can narrow it down and say, okay, this game is going to be about murder mystery. And then I replace that one category that used to be genre, which is the yellow one, with some another prompt that you use in the game. And, and for kids, I take genre away because kids don't understand genre so they understand emotions but substitute emotions but the whole idea is now now it can be a very specific game if you want it to be very specific for what you want to story tell or it can be very general and that again seemed to be when people talked to me they kept coming up with different genres they said fan fiction I'm going yeah I'm, I don't want to get sued for that <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to get sued by Gene Roddenberry's estate because I use all these stark terms. No, thank you. But I can do the erotica thing, and I can do the the murder mystery thing, and all of those, and and some whacked out categories. I also had one or two general whacked out categories where you would just throw in superpowers or something. I don't remember all of them because I created so many but some different categories that wouldn't fit into any necessary thing, but you can substitute, you can swap it out. So you just nice. take one and swap it out. And, and I guess, I'm sorry, I'm talking so much. The other no, thing no, no, is keep going, keep going. the creativity is really in the person. Like I've never played cards against humanity, but the, I think the funniness is in the cards, right? And the way they match or the way you put them together in this game, the words are the most, they're, they're not the clever part. The clever part is you and how you put together your story. And so if you think fast or you just want to go for laughs, you can do that. But, it, but the cleverness won't come from the cards or from the, or from the grid or the dice. Cleverness comes from how you put them together. It's Mad Libs backwards, right? Mad Libs. You you get the sto- you are asked for specific words. Here you're given the words. You got to write a story. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I guess I didn't think of it that way. It's Mad Libs backwards, huh? <laughs> Which of course I don't use in the advertising since I don't own that anymore. Um, but <laughs> right. Well, for right. those convention you know. games where you're trying to give like the one sentence pitch of how it plays, Mad Libs backwards. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> they, they all understand, and that's exactly right. They'll they'll get that. So what I can tell you is I hope you guys will play it. If you need another copy, yell, and I'll get you another copy. Um, but it, it is kind of fun. And I, as I said, after the first round, 
you, you kind of get your rhythm and you go, okay. And you get hand cramp. I'm trying to write so fast, but. Um... <laughs> no, hand cramp. Is that in the erotica section as well? <laughs> <laughs> it's not, but you know what? I'm editing that now and I'll fix that and add that. That's, that's, cool. that's who you go to see after, you know, or that's, that's what, you know, yeah. that's the story that follows after you get the hand cramp the first time. So funny thing at Dexcon, Twice they rolled erotica. One group decided not to do it. The other group decided okay. And you know they didn't they didn't do erotica at all, right? They just they said it was erotica, but it wasn't. But you can imagine what an evening that is with your friends. Um, because the words aren't necessarily the words you're given are suggestive, but they're not over the top. Right. It's it's how you use them, like anything in life how you use your words in the sentence structure and the sentences, that's what turns them into erotica. So, so if you guys do that, you have to send me your results or post them. To the <laughs> oh, our listeners know at this point, we have no shame. So if we, if we end up doing that one with like the erotica, it's going to get bad real fast. <laughs> like real the, fast. The, the subtlety will be like a sledgehammer. I'll put it that way. <laughs> we'll add sledgehammer to the erotica too. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Now it's uh, getting to become Fifty Shades of Writer blocks. Yeah, so no, folks, in no. case you haven't uh, paid attention the last few minutes, apparently we're just going to go ahead and write the erotica section of this whole game right now. Yeah. So <laughs> I like that. You know what? I'm going to have to. I'm writing Fifty Shades of Erotica blo- of Writer's Block. Damn. Because <laughs> of Who knows? Maybe I'll maybe I'll do a. a, a I'm kind of a posting on that. That's funny. That's awesome. very funny. So, so with these expansions, they they plug and play pretty easily. It doesn't it doesn't take a lot of work or like additional setup or anything crazy. No. It's just you decide to say we're going to use this expansion as well. Right. The way the way it works now, the the game comes with two prompt kids inside. If you want the others, you go online to the website and you click a button and pay like four bucks and you get two two extra prompt grids. And so each prompt grid has 60 million combinations, you know, mathematically. Oh, why would someone call me in the middle of this? Because that's, that's what always happens. I turn that off. So um, each grid has 60 million different combinations. So, you know, if you have four or five grids, the odds on you're getting the same prompts ever again, pretty damn slim. Yeah. And, and that's what most people, unless the dice are, not balanced you know if they're truly random then you should be getting all sorts of different things um and and the other thing i'll tell you is so gamers are interesting about rules i just learned this that they want to follow the exact rules they don't like or the gamers i met i should say they didn't like open-ended things oh yeah if if it's not clear and concise and this is exactly what it is like law they're gonna have issue with it so this was a very interesting experience for me. So I wrote, I wrote instructions, and they're very brief. They take, you know, a five and a half by eight and a half sheet. There's three versions of play: There's group play, um, party party game, group of writers, and a single writer. Three different versions. Um, okay. And then, then I wrote a whole lot of other instructions that were very tongue in cheek because I'm a writer. So I thought it'd be very funny to write these instructions that kind of take you all over the place and not insult you, but kind of reprimand you for asking questions that maybe you should be asking. <laughs> and, and I got a really interesting reaction. Either people either really thought it was funny or they really, really thought, what the hell is wrong with me in writing these directions? So, you know, I, I recommend that people follow the short directions unless they have a large attention span and and want a laugh. <laughs> I, I, Noted. Yeah. I um, It's interesting because the way I designed the game, as long as everyone at the table agrees to a rule change, then you can have it. And that wasn't kind of what I experienced when people around the table played the game. They didn't want that ability to do that. They, oh, yeah. If you're talking to, like, more of your hardcore gamers, there yeah. is no such thing as making up your own rules on the fly. You don't do that. Oh, well, Casual I'm... gamers will do that. Hardcore gamers will not do that. 
So, so I learned that too, right? So you could, if you guys are, you guys are hardcore clearly, when you play, ignore the rest, ignore the other pages. Just go by the front, the front page, and it's it's easy to follow. But if you want laughs, you know, read the rest of it. Of course, <laughs> excellent. So, how many how many rounds does it normally take to get through the game? I know we talked a little bit about it, but we haven't really uh, touched on it too too much because I know a lot of people are thinking this sounds great, but how long does it take to play the game? How long is the average game? Okay. Time? So, so it's a six in the party mode. It's a six minute round. So, once you read the directions, the short directions, you know that really takes all of three minutes. So, you've got three minutes to read the directions the first time. You roll the dice, and it takes about a minute and a half to match the number on the die to the grid, right? Because you're doing it one at a time and it's a little slower than you would think. Um, and then you start writing in six minutes. And you can you write about two minutes worth of reading in six minutes is about the most you're going to write. So if you have four people in your group, your round will take about six minutes plus, you know, two times four is eight. So it'll be 14, 15, 16 minute round. And you're ready for the next. And sometimes the plot twist card will add time. If it's a particular, particularly difficult plot twist, it'll add a minute or add a two. Nothing significant. Um, and it throws you off. It throws you off. The point, the whole point is to throw you off balance that you may have to undo everything you just wrote or somehow justify it like a dream sequence. That's one of the cards is make everything a dream sequence. And so you have to come up with a second story <laughs> that's a dream sequence for that would probably throw me for a loop. I'd get involved and just be like, oh, damn it. And just sit there and <laughs> for like a minute. <laughs> uh-huh. And, and, and that can happen, right? But the more you play it, 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 you tend to get a rhythm and you kind of figure out, okay, this is how I work through this. Um, so, you know, rounds will take 15 minutes. So usually the truth is this is not a two and a half hour game. People, by, by the time you've spent an hour, an hour and a quarter with it, you're probably done. It's probably time for your next game. Nice. nice. Okay. But you end up with something you can take away with you, right? The, the thing about the game is you can actually walk away with stories. Well, yeah, at the end of the day, it is still a writer's tool. So right. you could end up writing this thing and be like, I'm going to go with this a little bit farther than just playing a game. Like I want right. to write an actual story based on this. And And that's actually so... You're absolutely right. You can do that. Or some people will start with it that way, that they'll just use it. And they won't set six minutes because they're writing alone or they're writing in a writer's group and they're using it to illustrate something. They're either using it to learn something. Maybe it's about plot or character or something. So they'll write for 15 minutes or 20 minutes or they'll use it to do a short story and they won't stop. And that's that's kind of where the rules don't apply anymore. It's whatever you want to do with it, whatever you want to make out of it. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So, but again, it all comes back to storytelling. If you're a person who likes to tell stories, if you're a person who likes to challenge yourself to make things hard, if you're the guy or the woman who turns the box of the jigsaw puzzle upside down because you don't want to look at the picture after the first time, right? You'll look at the pieces, but you won't look at the actual picture again. This is the kind of thing for them that goes, I'm going to challenge myself. I'm going to see how far I can take this. Interesting. Yeah, I could see that. Hmm. I could see a lot of, uh, ro- you know, especially, especially people that play a lot of RPGs right. that are, are more like I get story focused and not so mm-hmm. combat heavy. I can see a lot of people really getting behind this is, you know, even a, a if the, even if they kind of focus it down and say, okay, everything we do tonight, we're going to do this based around like Dungeons and Dragons ideas we had. So the right. prompts are still going to pop up, but we're going to, you know, we're going to twist it to be just, you know, like D and D focused or Shadowrun focused or, sure. you know, or, you know, Numenera focused, like, like pick that game and, you know, see what people come up with because that, that would be a great way for them to, you know, kind of move their games forward or help flesh out stuff for campaigns they have planned. Right. So it, it's interesting how anyone can apply this any different way. And and again, that's, I'm sure I can't even imagine. I know there's an educational component to this for kids that 
it I've tried it and you're not going to make a kid who doesn't want to write want to write you may get them to do it once in a while you're not going to force them to do it but a kid who's on that edge who kind of wants to do something this can be the thing that turns it more into a game than an assignment so I've got all sorts of places I'm looking to where this will hit first really big. But I definitely, everyone who sees it says the same thing. Who wants to tell stories? They go, this is really cool. And they want to play it again. And they want to play it again. But they're doing it for themselves and they want to do it because they want to see what the next person does with it. And that's, yeah. that's the community part. That's the part where it isn't just an individual writer's game, but it's actually a party game or a game that you play with other people. Excellent. Excellent. So I know we're coming to the end of the episode, but is, so how, how much longer is this game on Kickstarter? Oh, please, please, please. Everyone who sees this go to Kickstarter. You guys have the address, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, it's only on until July 30th. Okay. So I was, I was hoping to have a bigger showing for it, but I, I'm not displeased, but I was hoping to have a bigger showing and acceptance because all that money gets plowed back into the marketing, right? And, and by the way, I should say, the other piece of this is I already produced the games. I wasn't going to wait for Kickstarter to give me the money and then have it not done. I already produced 250 games. So as soon as I get the money from Kickstarter, I'm ready to ship the games, which is unusual for Kickstarter projects, I think. So, um, okay. I just felt that if I wasn't willing to put myself behind it, why should I expect anyone else to put themselves behind it? Oh yeah, absolutely. So, I could see that. So, and so it's done. It's sitting here. I've got boxes and boxes of them sitting here ready to ship to people. Um, I just would love more backers because that'll give me the money back to go and do different marketing with it. Hmm. All right, cool. So, yeah, I'm looking at the Kickstarter page right now. It looks like you got about 12 days to go before it's over. Yeah. Excellent. And you've already funded, which, you know, that right there, for a lot of people, that can sometimes be the scary hump to see right. where things go, is they want to see, okay, did this fund? Right. You know, and right. And I followed, I followed kind of what you said, which was I set the number low. I had already paid for it. So it wasn't a matter of getting the money back to be able to produce it. It was It's produced. So I... I intend to make this, I'm going to do whatever I have to do to introduce this to every single person to see whether they can embrace it and see the magic in it. I want storytellers everywhere to use it. Excellent. So let me ask you a five-year plan. Where would you see this game? Oh, I think, I think there's the card version. I think there's, you know, very, very specialized versions. And I think that it ends up, I think it ends up in a target, you know, that, not there are all sorts of problems that come with going mainstream, but but I think it's a mainstream game. I, I think it becomes a perennial that people go, Oh yeah, of course. That you know, that's one of the games we play. We pull that out and we play that every once in a while. Nice. Okay. So you definitely see this going mainstream. You're not thinking it will just stay at the game stores. I you know, I hope. And I and it's not for me. I hope for the game that it plays well enough with people and that people get enough out of it that they want it mainstream. It's not, it's not for me that I want it there. It's that I think it'll do, I think it'll do something special. And I think adding it to the community and having people being able to share their stories just makes this a whole different thing. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I can totally see that. Excellent. So Nick, is there anything else you want to throw in there uh, before we uh, start wrapping this up? Uh, really, um, I was, I was kind of already interested at, uh, busting it out at the, uh, next event, but, you know, after talking, talking with you and talking through it even more, I'm, uh, I'm actually super excited to break it out and, uh, and see, especially when there is a, a few drinks involved and you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll even break out that, uh, new fancy, uh, camera I've got and, and record some of it so that we can really see the hilarity that ensues. Oh, I would, and, and I hope you'll send me the links because I would love to see that. Oh, definitely. Definitely. That's something we record and uh, you, you'd be probably one of the first people to get it once it's all done rendering. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Pretty much. 
Awesome. Well, folks, that's going to wrap up this episode of Skirmish Supremacy, and uh, we will see you next time. Thanks. Bye. Thanks for listening to another episode of Skirmish Supremacy. To see more of the antics that Nick and I do, you can check us out on Facebook at Skirmish Supremacy. We also have Twitter, which we can be reached at Skirmish Supreme, because apparently Skirmish Supremacy does not fit in Twitter. And if you want to email us directly, you can reach us at tim at skirmishsupremacy.com or nick at skirmishsupremacy.com. Thanks for listening.